if you're wearing like a Trump shirt, for example, or like a, a Biden shirt, like there's like violence, right? So things have gotten much worse. Here in New York, uh, it would be dangerous if you were walking around with a Trump hat, like make America great hat or t-shirt. Uh, well, my name is Patrick. Um, I'm currently in New York, New York City, and I moved to New York right after university in 2014 um, because of work, of course. Uh, prior to New York, I was in Michigan. Uh, I went to university in Michigan, high school, and a little bit of uh, middle school. So I had been in Michigan since I was 12 years old, straight from East Africa. So I grew up in Kenya, I mean, a little bit of Southern Africa as well, and Zambia mostly, prior to coming uh, to the States with my parents. I didn't know you were in Zambia. I thought you were, I thought you were in, so you were born in Rwanda. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Okay, well then this helps with the first question, which is what was growing up like for you? Well, it depends. <laughs> what does it depend on? <laughs> depends uh, growing up where? Well, you tell me. So, you, so you're born in Rwanda and then... I was when... born in northern... Uh, Northern Congo, which is kind of like a territory, Northeast territory, uh, like historically, like it's part of Rwanda, but now it's recognized as part of the Congo, which is called Goma. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was two years old when I left, so I cannot really talk about how it was growing up there. That's why I asked... (laughs) Growing up where? Okay. So you don't have any memories of Rwanda? Or did you ever go back since? Nope. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, I mean, as a two-year-old, it would be a miracle to have memories. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) But I do have memories uh, growing up in Kenya and Zambia. And um, I think it was was actually, it, it was not bad. You know, Kenya, uh, what I remember was that um, the activities that uh, like kids, young kids did were mostly like running. Literally, it's almost like a stereotype. Um, like you'd race each other and just like play tag and like see who's the fastest. Um, and then compared to Zambia, it was mostly uh, soccer or football. Okay. Yeah, so it's like there's like a bit of a culture difference when it comes to sports. That's one thing that I remember the most. And what age? So you went to Kenya when you were two? Yep. And this is because of the genocide, right? Yes. Uh huh. It's like mass exodus. Well, if you could get out. Yeah, I mean, if you couldn't get out, uh, there was a high probability that you would get uh, slaughtered. And that also depended uh, on what um, ethnic group you were part of or like how your family composition was. And as you know, uh, it was uh, mostly people who are of Tutsi who were targeted due to the fact that um, the like the incumbent president uh, was uh, Hutu and was recently uh, murdered by a, a regime, a, like a, an outside regime that considered itself Tutsi. So what happened was uh, people on the radio who were mostly Hutu, like the national public radio, went on there and they said they just killed our president per se and go find um, like 
uh, any Tutsi that you, you can get your hands on and slaughter them, and they call them cockroaches. So that's and I call them what? what? Cockroaches. And your yeah. family were Tutsis? Uh, it's a combination of many. So, yeah, uh, I don't think... Hmm. Personally, like, I don't identify with either. Yeah. And so how did you learn about this? Because presumably, well, yeah, obviously, as you said, it was, like, before your memory. So did you later, mm-hmm. like, at what point did it, how old were you, I guess, when you became aware that what had happened and why you were in a different country? I think it's as you start uh, comprehending, especially like learning um, languages, right? Like uh, initially, we uh, we were only allowed to basically speak English and French, or French. And but, however, my parents did not communicate in those languages amongst each other. So gradually. I started learning um, Swahili and then Kenya Rwanda, which is a native language of uh, Rwanda and also the northern, part, the northeast part of uh, the Congo. So as um, I start, as as I comprehended those languages, I also started learning about the reason we were in a foreign country. Okay, because they they would talk about it especially when they had visitors from out of town, like uncles and aunts like that we've never seen. And then like, oh, I haven't seen you since, you know. And then they would also bring them news because like, oh, unfortunately, um, our brother was murdered as well. So like that's how they also would learn about their family members. For example, um, my biological mother, she comes from a family of 13, and there's only, I believe, only two or three of them that survived. Oh, my God. Yeah, so you learn about, and she, you know, of course, like, there, there was not, like, um, Facebook or Instagram or the Internet. Even if it, that would have happened in the West, it would have taken time for you to learn about what had happened to your families, yeah. And your mum, she went somewhere else, didn't she? She didn't go to Kenya. Um, I mean, it took time. It was a, it, there was a, a lag of time uh, when we all like got together. Yeah, because initially uh, the parents like they were not living in the same household, so it. Like the uh, migration process, there was a bit of a lag for us to be together at some point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, did you feel like you fit in in Kenya or like with the other kids? Yeah, uh, and I think the main reason was because, um, I mean, as you are aware, uh, uh, the two main languages they speak in Kenya is English and or uh, Swahili. And I know I have an accent in English, which is mostly influenced by the, f- the first language I learned, which is French. However, my Swahili back then, even now I still speak it, was as good as my peers. So there was no like none of them could distinguish the difference like or even they were not aware that I was a foreigner yeah mm-hmm. and uh so like yeah so yeah like I don't recall anybody treating me different because uh, of uh who I was however that started changing as I started learning new languages different countries so example in Zambia it changed a bit because I had to learn Chewa like we moved there without us knowing and an ounce of Chewa, which is the equivalent of Swahili in Zambia, right? 
And uh, I would literally just communicate in English, even though most kids did not speak English. So in classrooms, I'll just speak English until I learned Chewa. And then my dad had like a little bodega. So the neighbors would uh, be envious because we, we, would, we were doing like ec- economically wise, to some extent, we're doing better as foreigners. So there is that, uh, you know, envy, which is, is everywhere, whether we talk about the UK or here in the States. So that's when I started, you know, feeling a little different and that got amplified. Uh, when we moved to the States, because, of course, there is no language that I don't have an accent in, in the States. <laughs> so it's easily distinguished that, yeah, he's a foreigner. So, from, yeah. so how old were you when you went to Zambia? So Zambia, uh, so we spent five, uh, roughly around five years, so we can round up um, in, uh, in Kenya, uh, with a few months, uh, so I was eight. So two plus five is seven, but those like, months in between, so rounding up. And then uh, another like four to five years in Zambia, and then the States, I was 12. And why did you move to Zambia for the economic reasons? Or what was, yes. why did you move? So it was a bit easier uh, to conduct business because um, there was a, still a big opportunity to like, uh, you could easily set up shop. So like just like a little uh, like brick and mortar that you have, like maybe a hundred SQ, uh, SQUs of uh, different products, especially essential ones like uh, hundred SKUs. <laughs> That's so funny that you're using such <laughs> consulting language. So um, different variations. Yeah, so they can have like hundred different products, uh, whether as from like essential things like um, uh, bread, milk, eggs to like a lot of, uh, especially in Zambia, women they love beauty products. So we will be able to import them from other parts of Africa, like South Africa, and then you can sell those. Mm -hmm. And there was, why was there less opportunity in Kenya to do that? Uh, Because Kenya, we were in Nairobi, so yeah, sorry, I did not specify why. So Nairobi, which is the capital in Kenya, and then also Lusaka, which is the capital in Zambia. So if you compare the two, Nairobi is more commercially uh, developed, so you have uh, big prayers. So if um, a person can afford to buy um, like luxury beauty products, they'll go to the mall. They'll go to an, uh, like a, a bigger store that's you know uh, much more developed. But like in Lusaka, especially outside like um, the downtown area, you have these packets of neighborhoods that are very populated. However, there is no um, stores that can uh, sell to like uh, lo- uh, like middle mi- uh, like middle middle class or like um, higher like high low middle class. I don't I don't know the terminology for that, but yeah, yeah. So yeah, interesting. So that must have been. Yeah, that must have been a big move then if you didn't know the language and you... Did you know anyone living there? Are um, you vaping? <laughs> um, it's... Uh, we did know... Uh, let me see. Actually, no. We we did know, like, a few people, but who, they were not as close to us. Yeah. But Zambia does have quite a lot of uh, immigrants from um, the Congo and Rwanda because it it is actually closer uh, than Kenya is. And then the languages are almost similar like um, because they are all Bantu languages and um, there is like some similarities. It's much easier compared to Swahili. 
So it is mostly influenced by um, Arabic because of the trade that happened centuries ago. So did you end up making friends with other immigrant kids or you made friends with locals yes. as well? It, it was it was both, yeah. So immigrant kids, especially through church, attending church. Uh, however, it was mostly locals because uh, the schools that I went to, I was mostly the only immigrant because most of the time uh, the immigrant kids uh, did not go to school. So I count myself very fortunate because my father was very, very diligent in making sure that we attended school and like spent the extra money that we had for us to actually go to private school instead of the public schools. Huh. And so did he... So what, the other immigrant kids would have been working in the family business? Yeah, family businesses or just... um, like, yeah, just not going to school at all. Or they're just helping out, or yeah, or them having a job because there is no, the, the labor rules, or laws, they're not as strict uh, outside of the West. Even here in the West, like if it's a family business, you can start working as a five year old. Yeah. And do you know where your dad got his belief in education from? Um, I do believe it was because he had to drop out of uh, grade school when he was less than 10 years old after his father passed. And he ended up helping at the farm with his mother. And uh, fast forward in his uh, late teens, early 20s, uh, he starts his own business. Uh, like builds the first house in the village that had indoor plumbing and electricity. So he already he already he always knew that he was intelligent enough to do uh, great things. However, um, and ended up doing it. However, all that was eradicated because of the war. Our house was bombed. The businesses were destroyed. Ransacked. Lost. More, all the money that was in the bank uh, but when he looked at uh, some of his peers because he was in a, kind of like a group that were, his friends that were successful whether they were doctors like with lawyers who had gone to education who, who had a great education were able to kind of navigate um, a way of like kind of like um, still sustaining the status because the education helped. So like he imagined what if he had the opportunity uh, to go to university or even complete high school. I think, yeah. That's so interesting. So he basically had to rebuild again from scratch. Yeah. And then how did the move to Michigan come about? So we initially uh, were granted were granted asylum uh, in Chicago, and we lived in the north part of Chicago, um, which is called Lodges Park, uh, predominantly um, Latinx neighborhood, Hispanic neighborhood. And uh, in the northern part of Chicago, I don't know if you're aware, it's very far from downtown. And um, it was difficult for them to find jobs. Yeah, so the northern uh, northern part, it's the opposite of where um, the University of Chicago is. Because the downtown Chicago is in the middle of the north and then the University of Chicago. Because the University of Chicago is in the south. And um, unless we spoke Spanish, um, it would and then like the, most of the jobs in that neighborhood where we were in Lodges Park were uh, were catered like our businesses were catered to uh, Spanish speaking uh, people, you know, which makes sense. So my parents, of course, they couldn't speak Spanish, and uh, the only jobs they would be able to obtain were very far 
like by like at, uh, you know in downtown and also they did not pay well so we were in communication with some of our friends that we had actually met in Zambia and had been in the States uh, um, for a few years already. And they taught us, hey, there's uh, an immigrant community of people from uh, East Africa, uh, even Southern Africa in West Michigan, and you'll be able to get it um, like a job easily. And then that's when we made the move. And within a month, both of them had jobs. Amazing. In Michigan, yeah. Mm-hmm. And what were your first memories of the U.S.? Like, were you happy to well, move? Um, no, my first memory was actually disappointing. Um, no, I was really happy to move. I thought this was going to be utopia. Um, my first memory, I remember, it was at the... We landed in at JFK first, and then we had to uh, uh, we had to, uh, make a connection to O'Hare in Chicago. So JFK, I'm waiting. Like, we're waiting to, like, board another plane, and I see this American kid with a Game Boy, little game, and then I politely, I'm like, may I please use it too? <laughs> <laughs> this kid ran away. <laughs> Like I was nah. the devil, and I was like, "Wow, <laughs> rude!" <laughs> and so this is when I started questioning things. <laughs> that is so funny. Yeah. But, oh my uh... god. <laughs> that reminds it... me of this is like the opposite. But a friend of mine at Cambridge is from Ghana and had never left Ghana until he mm-hmm. came to the UK in the middle of a lockdown. Yeah. And his first experience at the airport was, like, he tried to buy, like, went and got a coffee and couldn't, like, his card wasn't working and couldn't pay for it. And then someone paid for the coffee for him and he was like, this place is amazing. Like, everything's just free. People just buy stuff for you. Just like, which is just not how it is, obviously. But Yeah. Uh-huh. I think you, you, you just have to, I mean, there was apps ups and downs and then meeting people who are mean, people who are nice. And then you just have to realize that like regardless where you are, you will meet someone who will buy you a coffee when your card is not working and also you meet someone who will run away when you even ask to like play with their little um, video game. <laughs> right? So like that's everywhere. <laughs> yeah. So how, okay, yeah, when you were talking about Chicago, I was just trying to think if we had ever been there together because I went for a few times um, with work. But I, because how how did we meet? Like, obviously, we met working at EY together, but was it on a training or something? Yeah. Do you remember? uh... I do believe I remember it was, yeah, it was, it was at a training and that was when, um, it was combined with, uh, the NBA hires as well, because that's when we met our friend from Italy. That's at the same time. Who I don't know if you remember. The, the very nice guy <laughs> from Italy. Uh, wait, his name is, I can't remember, but like, yeah. Oh, Federico? <laughs> I, oh my god, I don't remember. Okay, that was... Okay, anyway. What, okay, what are you... Did we talk about what you're doing now? Did you um, say that no. in your introduction? <laughs> no, you just said you're in New York. Whereabouts yeah, in New I mean, York yeah. are you? This is also just for the audience, like me and you catching up, having... <laughs> <laughs> on each other's lives. Uh, I mean, um, I mean, uh, Fidei, by where um, the Cornell guys used to live. Oh, the so same like place you've been district. in. The same flight the you've been in for ages. But yeah, five years. Wow. So, and yeah. how long have you been in New York now? Like 
So I'm pushing eight. So I moved here in 2014. And what yeah, is so... your role now? Because I went and stalked your LinkedIn for the update and it looks like you haven't updated it in like seven years, unless you just haven't been promoted in seven years. <laughs> oh, wow. A very rude. <laughs> no, I haven't updated it. <laughs> so what are you doing? Me? Um, or is it a secret? No, it's not a secret. I'm just doing uh, some uh, projects <laughs> that one cannot talk about. <laughs> Confidential stuff. Still work, still working capital type stuff. No, Finance stuff. not at EY. Where are you? <laughs> yeah, see, your LinkedIn says you're still like a like the same position I was when I left at EY. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be sad. Um, no, because my peers, some of them are actually like senior managers. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, no, no, no longer at EY. Okay. I will update you uh, on the... Uh... Okay. You're doing something top secret in New York related to finance. Or you've totally changed careers. <laughs> I mean, you're yeah, now... it is finance. It? <laughs> you're now an actor on Broadway. Uh, no, I can't sing. You need a British, a British accent sing. To, to be on Broadway, mm-hmm. British accent. Really? You okay. should edit that out. Sounds like I'm making fun of British people. No, not at all. Okay, so so when so you moved to New York from where were you before Grand Rapids? No, sorry, that's um, in Michigan. No, should we go back Michigan, to Michigan? Yes, yeah. So. Yeah, I went to, so we moved from Chicago to Grand Rapids, which is West Michigan, uh, roughly around 30 miles west of Lake Michigan. And I went to like middle school for like a year there, and then high school. Um, then for university, I went to Michigan State University, which is in East Lansing. Uh, is that about, near Grand Rapids? Uh, no, it's about 60 miles. Which, I mean, in the States, it's considered near, but in Europe, it's considered like you're almost in Russia from where you are. (laughs) (laughs) So it's like a two-hour drive or something? Yeah, roughly around two hours, an hour and a half, two hours, yeah. And what was school like in the U.S.? So school, high school was weird because... I think that's what most of the culture shock uh, were, uh, like was more prevalent because I went to school. I was fortunate enough to go to um, like um, a private school, which actually is connected to the former secretary of education, Betsy DeVos. So I went to school with oh. her kids. Yeah. Isn't she like... Um, I don't know how to describe her. Sorry? Yeah. Her family are billionaires. And there was a lot of other students who were, like, very, very well off. So, like, the people who run West Michigan, like, especially the Christian reform through the church, uh, like, I went to school with those uh, uh, students, those kids. So, like, the... Yeah, so the culture was quite different. But because she's a, like, Republican... I thought she was from the South or something. Not, oh, no. But she, the, yeah. But she's, like, yeah. has a kind of different accent. I mean, she's not, like, a New York Democrat type person. No, that doesn't matter. Actually, I didn't even see most of the politics as much. I know her husband did run for governor uh, while I was in school. I remember that. And then, uh, but yeah, she, I mean, they were less, like, uh, radical. 
in their views, conservative views, um, until 2016. Like, it was not bad. There was no uh, violence if one did not believe um, in it. Like in democratic views or Republican views, like it was just like you'll have a debate and then that'll just end. Like I remember even when, because Obama, uh, McCain, Obama, that was I believe my senior year. Like um, our history teacher and also government teacher like held debates from both point of views, and then you had students who were wearing Obama, students who were wearing McCain, and that was very like uh, civil. But now, like, people get beat up. Like, if you're wearing, like, a Trump shirt, for example, or, like, a, a Biden shirt, like, there's, like, violence, right? So things have gotten much worse. Yeah. Really? Like, people, mm-hmm. like, physical violence? Yes, there's physical violence. And also, um, what do you call it? There's also... Um, a lot of uh, property damage, vandalism. Like, uh, like my family, like in Michigan, they were telling me uh, there was like a house that had Biden um, posters, and then you had people like MAGA people who went and like threw, uh, like, tipped like toilet paper at the house, like destroyed like a lot of the exterior because you know they have been indoctrinated in a certain way of behavior, just like January 6th. Wow. And that's, yeah. And it's also like there are instances where, uh, like, I don't, like, it's not about the kids, especially like the younger kids, like in middle school, like kids who are in the, uh, uh, early teens or even like under 10. Like if their parents are Trump supporters or Republicans and they give them like a, Trump shirt, like they get bullied and it's not the kids fault, right? It's what the parents view and they transfer it over to the kid. Kid doesn't really know much so it's going to get bullied by people who are radical left. Mm. Mm -hmm. So like things have gotten Huh. And that Okay, and that's all since. Because, yeah, I haven't been back to New York mm-hmm. since I left, which was, yeah. when was that, five years ago? But so we would, yeah, so we worked together when um, Trump was elected. Mm-hmm. I remember that, like, I thought work, I thought work would be cancelled or something. <laughs> like, because it was so crazy in been. New York. Like, yeah. um just people on the streets everywhere. I remember going down Fifth Avenue just to see, because it was, like, just all roads blocked off. Like, there were just, like, thousands of people Mm -hmm. blocking off the street. Just, it was so weird. Um, But do you reckon that's kind of the turning point? Yeah. Yeah, so So, things are no longer simple. Sorry? Yeah, things are no longer civil. Like, you cannot have a civil debate or conversation when it comes to different political views. Mm. Yeah. Because, like, yeah. Uh, before, like, you could literally be at a um, dinner party and you can talk about differences. Like, you can talk about McCain, Obama, and then have a decent debate with that people becoming mad at each other or, you know, violence. But now, it's like, for example, you, here in New York, uh, it would be dangerous if you were walking around with a Trump hat, like a MAGA, like Make America Great hat or T-shirt. And then so... Really? People will yeah, heckle oh, yeah. you or... Oh, yeah. yeah like wow. a lot of the... Yeah, so like you know how uh, Trump has a lot of buildings that uh, in his namesake, right? Mm. So uh, the only ones yeah, I that's lived, still... I lived opposite one, my first... Um, yeah, on my first Wall Street, apart- right? On Wall Street, yeah. Yeah, so that one still bears his name because he owns it. So the ones that bear his name because of licensing, because, you know, some buildings like, oh, we're going to have a Trump name, we'll pay him 
uh, like loyalties or whatever license fees to to have it because it's cool. So those uh, the residents, especially if it's it was like a, a condominium, they had they have voted to remove the name. The only the ones that he outright owns still bear his name. Interesting. Uh huh. And yeah, a lot because of them we are vacant. <laughs> Interesting. Because <laughs> yeah, I remember um, the parties we would have, or we would go to, and it was always like you talk about politics, like, but it was always very. It was like okay, this guy, you know, believes it. Especially around like the Cornell guys, it would be like always talking about different views, and someone would be from a small town in like Maine or something and be saying like why they believe guns are really important and Mm -hmm. you know and but it was always so respectful and Mm -hmm. people are disagreeing but it's like okay cool you know it's more like cool you vote for this because that's where you grew up and I don't know it was like we just have conversations about yeah that it's like that was how you spent that was like what you did for fun kind of thing yeah (laughs) I don't, or I don't know what else we'd talk about. But, and and that's what I loved about the US actually, because um, you don't necessarily do that in other places. People don't necessarily talk about the issues. But do you mm-hmm. think that's, that's just way more sensitive now? Like people just steer away from topics or it just gets really aggressive if you start talking about it. Yeah, it's because, like, it's, like, no, there is, like, it's rare that you find, um, like, people, whether Republicans or Democrats, uh, who are willing to talk about, um, like, their political views if they are not extreme on either side. So the ones that you do see talk about it are the ones that are, you know, very extreme. For example, like, um, I don't know, like, if you've been following Roe v. Wade got overturned. So if you're going to start talking about your views as a, as a Republican, most likely you do believe, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah, <laughs> Roe v. Wade should not be... <laughs> Uh, a, uh, the law of the land and also when it comes to immigration like I don't know if you saw uh, the governor of uh, uh, Florida uh, Florida and Texas they literally bust uh, migrants who had been admitted legally admitted in the states to century cities, so liberal leaning cities like Martha, Martha's Vineyard, Washington D.C., Chicago, and um, and New York, without being transparent to those migrants as to where they are going, they literally um, lied to them. Like oh, there's a bus, the one that went to Martha's Vineyard, uh, they told them that they were being taken to Atlanta. And then unbeknownst to them, they literally, they like the governor spends millions of dollars shuttering them, first bus and then airplane, and they land on an island. And of course, the people at Martha's Vineyard. A beautiful Vineyard, island. Like, yeah, it's beautiful. They gave them clothes, they gave them food and all that. So like if you Republican, like extreme, you're going to be like, oh yeah, those are illegals. I'm like, well... First of all, if they are illegal immigrants, then why did you bust them into the heart of America? Why did you put them on a private plane, jet? Like, if they are illegal, then do not admit them whatsoever. So it's why? Like... D- so why did they do that? I haven't heard about uh, this. In spite, so they wanted to. Um, to basically, it was like a political stunt for them because uh, they're like, oh. You, you're pro immigrants, you pro immigration, migration, then deal with it. And then they were probably expecting uh, those people, because like people in Matas and Vineyard, they are very well off for the, mo- uh, for the most part. Like uh, 
Jeff Bezos has a house there. Oprah has a house there. Obama's have a house there. Yeah, so it's like holiday they, houses of billionaires. They, yeah, uh, so they were expecting uh, those people to to go crazy, like the residents at Martha's Vineyard, and and the the way uh, like the, cra- the the crazies who hate immigrants would act, but they were welcome with open arms. And where so they were expecting that. It... So the um, the governor of Texas is actually being investigated for human trafficking. Wow. So they came from Texas and they were uh, from Mexico originally uh, or all they, over? Like Central, South America, and then, of course, they, they went through Mexico. Most of them actually were not Mexican. I think they were Venezuelans, the ones that went to um, um Martha's Vineyard, the, the ones that were trafficked to Martha's Vineyard. Yeah. So, yeah. And then also when it comes to guns, right, like you were mentioning earlier, like someone who came from a small town and they had guns, everything was set up, be happy, we will talk about it, give your opinion. But now it's like kids are getting shot, like game. Mm. And there's nothing that's being done. Yeah, that's probably, I was probably a bit dishonest there. That was the one thing, the one topic I could not talk about was gun control because I would get so upset. Like, I would happily be like, talk. Uh-huh. do you remember? Yeah, because at work as well. It's like uh-huh. we'd have these conversations yeah. all the time. So interesting. Uh-huh. Like, everyone was so into it. Like, when mm-hmm. whenever there was some, you know, it's like CNN or whatever would always be on in the background. Like, everyone's following what's going on with in politics. Um, but... Um, yeah, I remember someone at work being like, um, people die from like natural disasters and cancer anyway. Like it doesn't matter that they die from gun, you know, like something like that. And I was like, oh my God, I just can't have this conversation. But I guess, yeah, that's also just because I come from somewhere that got rid of... Like, now I'm now I'm way more kind of... Now I'm just kind of interested in why people have views. And I realise... Because I had to go through that with Trump. Like, I don't really like the way I behaved. Like, I was very judgmental of people who voted for Trump. Like, my boyfriend at the time's parents. And I was like, how that is, like... How could a woman vote for him? Like, blah, blah, blah. I was so... But that wasn't me trying to understand. Like, now I more have the approach that it's, like, trying to listen to that person and, like, what what are they worried about? Like, what are they thinking about that's making them do something that I wouldn't expect? Because, yeah, there were people at work, like, people think it's such a, like, oh, only rednecks or something. But I remember at EY, in the office, there was... You know, I bet a drink on this with someone. They were like, you know, this person voted. Like, this girl voted for him. And I was like, no way. And we had a bet. And then I went and asked her and she was like, yeah, I did. Because, yeah, you couldn't really admit it. You kind of had to lay low, which is not really what, I don't know, so complicated. Yeah. And then now, like, yeah, I agree with you. Like, um, like the way I look at it is, there is one thing. It's like, um, like if you choose party of a country, and then there is a problem. Like, there is one thing to like. I do like I'm actually an independent. Like, I don't like I voted for either parties, but mostly um, in in locally. That's when I like vote for I free prop. But nationally, because like we haven't really had great candidates um uh, from the Republican side. I, I know like I I love Obama, of course I voted for Obama and then now the other guy came. Like there's no way like it's just like principles and character, like that's not a person I would want to even be my neighbor. But my cane I would I wouldn't mind him being my neighbor. I wouldn't mind him being uh, like a mentor. Uh, rest in peace. Uh, but the other guy, whew, 
the former guy. Mm-mm. So that's when like I asked the question, like, what do you see in him? Do you actually believe in his uh, real t- like the things that he is spitting out of his mouth? Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's just yeah. So the other thing that's really seemed worrying from afar is that the um, vaccine stuff became really political, oh, yeah. which I didn't realise that you couldn't ask someone if they've been vaccinated because that was like a political question or mm-hmm. that's what some Americans have told me. Um, yeah. Because, yeah, that gets very scary if it something that's to do with healthcare becomes to do with who you vote for as in like your own personal health choice yeah and I think it became politicized and that same thing goes back to the character thing right the former guy was all like you know like just catering to his base saying that hey um um your body, your choice, like do whatever. Also, like um, kind of like acted as if he did not get vaccinated, but he was one of the very first people in the world to actually get vac- vaccinated, and then he hid it from the public, right? Yeah, of course he would, because he's obsessed <laughs> with germs, right? I know. Yeah, uh, it's a I've told you about my friend who's met him, right? Who's like, mm-hmm. and it's like he won't shake hands, like he won't. He's, like, obsessed with, like, hand sanitizer and stuff. Like, before, uh-huh. like, right, many yeah, years uh-huh. before the pandemic. Yeah. So, yeah, so that, yeah, it's, like, another red flag on his leadership and all that, just lying to the people, just making... I think he's, like, uh, the one thing I can give him credit for, he is really great at making ship of people. What does that mean? So, oh, you know sheep. how sh- sheep, uh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. like, yeah, so like basically that's what he was, tr- he, he was trying to do and he also did accomplish it, right? Like, uh, like those people who stormed the Capitol on January 6th, like they were not, like a lot of, like, uh, they're not deplorables, like Harry said, like that. I think that's one of the things that killed her candidacy, just like looking down on people, like calling them sheep. Like, you know, they were not like uh, people like Hilly or whatever. You had people who are lawyers, you had people, ex-military, people with PhDs who were amongst, you know. Really? Storming <laughs> uh-huh, the capital? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. yeah. So, yeah. It wasn't was... John Doe. <laughs> What was the reaction to that when it happened? Uh, like, because you were, right? yeah, oh. you were in New York when it happened. Yeah, right? I was. Yeah, I was sitting right here. Um, I actually was like in the middle of the day, actually, and then I had beers in my fridge. Just cracked one of it. Started watching. <laughs> so it was, it it was scary, but. To be honest, I was kind of relieved and happy in a sense that a lot of people, especially here in the U.S., they take like uh, our peace, liberty, and uh, freedom for granted. And... There were a lot of people, like you were saying, they didn't mean harm, who voted for the other guy and still, uh, like, supported him. But I wanted them to see what can happen if you are complicit. And that was just a little taste, because usually one thinks that that, 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 would, that would only happen or ever happen in a third world country. And that's actually one of the things that Nancy Pelosi was saying. They just released a new footage of Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, uh, like in their little safe uh, bunker while everything was going on. And she was like, this is third world country shit. And hey, no. 
idiocracy does not discriminate. If you're complicit um, while you complicit about having a leader who's like preaching evil, uh, you know, division and hatred, you that sh those sheep will rise up when they don't get their way. And that's what mm -hmm. happened. Yeah, so I think it was a great lesson. And then after that, you did see a, a lot of uh, prominent uh, Republicans come forward and condemn him. Mm. I think it was a nice little lesson. So do you think there's hope for going back to how it was when you were at school where you could be Republican, you could be Democrat, you can, and you respect each other. I believe so. I think it's going to take uh, two more cycles. So about 10 years. Or even three. So let's just say, tw uh, yeah, so it's going to be 12. So three more uh, rounds. So you have 2024 and then you're going to have uh, uh, 2028 and 20, what is it? <laughs> so, 32. 12. 32, yeah. 12. God. Oh, yeah, 32. Yeah. Wait, is that right? 2030. Yeah, 2030. Yeah, uh huh. When's and, the next election? 2024. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we have uh, the big one that's coming. Those are the uh, primaries for. Co uh, Congress, right? So the House and the Senate. So in November, so that would determine uh, if one, which the most important one, the Senate. If because uh, right now we have, yeah, we have fifty. Fi yeah, so we have fifty Democrats, and then no, I think we have fifty. Yeah, we have fifty. Democratic senators, and I believe 49 Republican. So it's almost split. And then the tiebreaker is the vice president. So if there's a tie, the vice president is the one that breaks the tie. So right now, um, like if you look at the forecast, it, it, it could go either way. So the, the Democrats could uh, gain an additional seat so that way everything will actually be concrete. Like there's no filibuster and they can do whatever they want, um, especially when it comes to codifying Roe v. Wade on the, on the federal level. So without like no more, like uh, each state can decide like if abortion is legal or not. So it's going to be on the federal level, just like uh, uh, like um, marriage equality. Like it's, no, they have to codify that too because they're trying to make it into uh like a state rights thing like marriage equality and it, that's, <laughs> yeah. yeah i think yeah that was pretty surprising for me um oh. even yeah not that like this is even that the abortion thing was still something talked about when i and this is what i think that australians and like don't a lot of people adopt views from the u.s and they see stuff online but it's like and i mean you've been to You've been to Melbourne and yep. met my parents yep. <laughs> and friends and the kangaroos. But it's like people, like you would have picked up that it's like a very different country and we don't, like abortion just hasn't been uh, talked about in the mainstream like for like years and years, and like not in my right. lifetime that I'm aware of and same with guns, right? And so being in the U.S., I don't think people understand that, um, that the social issues um, or even, for example, like would never have a, a politician have to stand up and talk about how they go to church or, you know, which seems to be the thing with Trump, which is yeah, funny about Trump that he just says this stuff about that he yes. goes to church and whatever, which is obviously isn't true, but it's like that's what you have to say it's like that whole social those social issues and those like deeply kind of religious ideas I guess I just 
have any experience that in the UK or Australia. Um, but I, the other thing that I wanted to ask you about is how the thing that was really shocking to me about the US is how patriotic it is. And I wondered how you, as in from the moment you step in the airport and it's like you see the framed photo of the president and you, um, you know, July 4th and it's like celebrating. Although I wonder, has that toned down now that people are like thinking more about the past and the history of the US? Like toned down as in? As in people like, oh, should you know, because it's like people would say, I think I heard that every day I lived in the US for four years. America's the greatest country in the world. It's like, that's really like, we're the best, like, this is so great. But now that people are thinking more about what happened in the past, right. or is it still like that? It is still like that because, um, I don't know. People, and no, I don't think it's changed. But um, the one thing that lacks, like people should realize, is uh, it's it's very sad that um, when someone critic- criticizes certain parts of our country, whether it's uh, policing, uh, especially policing, uh, the way we treat um, like our neighbors, like uh, here uh, in, in south of us, immigrants, like they get a lot of shit thrown at them because like they, they are deemed to be unpatriotic. But that is a very, very stupid way of looking at it because you criticize something because you care about it. Like you evaluate your well-being, your mind, uh, your mental health because you care about yourself. You don't ignore it. You seek help. You, You find ways to fix it. You, you, when your engine check engine light comes on on your car, you take it to the mechanic as soon as possible. Why can't you be open to doing so about the nation that you care about, the nation that you think is the greatest? Same as a marriage. Like, of course, you, you don't get married to someone you think is not the best in the world. Right, but when you, something um, like red flags come through, or there's a little bit of uh, indifferences that develop over time, if you really care about it, you diagnose it and you seek help. And then, worst case scenario, you ignore it, and then there's a divorce. You know, like you separate. You know, there are people who give up, who who have moved to Canada. There was a mass, uh, like, diaspora to Canada and then also to Australia from the U.S. after 2016. Those people are the ones that I hate. It might be the greatest country in the world, but hey, I do not want to be part of it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I even found that with stuff as simple as, like, the holes in the road in New York, like when people would look down on me. And I wonder if you experience this much, but it's like people, I guess it's just ignorance, like lack of education. Um, But people would really, yeah, treat me. But this is also educated people. Anyway, would really treat me like I was from this like really like terrible place and I had to like climb my way out of there to make it to the land of opportunity and it was just so shocking to me because I'm like there's no holes in the road where I come from it's like things seem to work but it there's not there's no holes in the road where you come from because everything is a hole okay yeah thank you (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, I know it's 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 quite uh, sad. Like I've been asked, um, you know, like many times, a lot of people assume that I lived in huts in Africa, right? Like, what did I eat? And I was like, really? <laughs> Now imagine Australia, like still, like <laughs> if people can say such things to you from Australia, which is in a lot of benchmarks, it's better <laughs> than here. All right? uh, now imagine what they say about Africa. <laughs> so do you feel proud to be American? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because I'm willing to work. I'm willing to educate uh, those that have no clue what's outside the border. And mind you, the guys, even if you're educated, there are a lot of people who have never left if, even their own state. Yeah, so there are people who would be shocked. For example, if you grew up in Maine and have never left Maine and went to West Virginia, you'd be like, what in Zimbabwe is this? <laughs> Actually, I was going to ask you about that. What do people in Michigan, like what do your friends back there think of New York? Well, you have some that, of course, like the thing is like, amazing, great. And uh, also you have some that say it's a heathen city. So heathens. So it's like uh, Sodom and Gomorrah to them. What? Yeah. They, 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 they see it as Sodom and Gomorrah. What's that? You, you know, like, the, it's, the, it's that phrase in the Bible that God destroyed because it was too sinful. Like, people were having oh. uh, orgies, people were, like, having same-sex relations and all that, and then God literally... Like, that's why, like, remember there's, like, a statue of a woman who turned into salt? I think it was Saul's wife or something like that. Because she looked back. Like, God was like, leave the city if you want to survive. And then she looked back in a sense, like, she still wanted part of that. And then she turned into salt. <laughs> Interesting. I learned so yeah. much today, Patrick. <laughs> okay. And what do they think of you living there? Or it's just kind of good for Patrick. He's making his way in the world. Yeah. 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 That's um, like, like, I should come back. But I'm like, I don't really listen to people, but their opinions. <laughs> but yeah, like, like, yeah, like West Michigan, for example, like a lot of people, like if they, have, if they want to go to a big city, uh, they go to Chicago because it's, nearby and then they don't even last long like within a few years they go back like a lot of my peers did that yeah and I only know you see two or three people from high school uh, that are in New York Mm -hmm. and do you see yourself ever leaving I mean, I want to retain residence here, um, even if I don't live here full time. But yeah, I, I can, yeah, definitely. But I do definitely want to have the footprint here at all times because this is my home. New York, like New, yeah, like New York. It's like it's a different country within a country. <laughs> what do you like most about it? I just feel like most people can just be themselves and like nobody like you but you probably notice it like for the most part like unless like you're cross with like it's like friends like nobody really gives a shit about you like nobody's gonna take time out of their uh, day and look at you as a stranger but what the hell is going on people just do their own thing I think it's because people are busy or also it's because there's a lot more things to think about when you're in this city compared to like other places. Like people 
Paris, spend days talking about you, going to church, praying for you. <laughs> if you were dressed a different way or change your hair color to yellow or something like that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it is such a special place. I remember yeah. it's... Yeah, it's so just... It would be like a Friday night or Saturday night and it's just like you just text whoever. It's like, where where should we go? What party should we go? You know, it's like... And even, yeah, if you're having a party, it's like you have no idea who's going to turn up because there's no loyalty like that. It's just like you go mm-hmm. where the kind of city takes you or whatever. Like, we, yeah, me and you have ended up in such, like, random situations. But it's just, like, fun yeah. and then you meet people. But everyone seems to be like that. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, so it is... Yeah, I guess the downside of that is if you're not keeping up with the... Because, yeah, it's like everyone's working hard. It's hard to... And then just, like, partying, I guess. It's hard to slow down like do you find that you're you can slow down and do normal stuff like go for a walk or oh yeah like uh like let me see is yesterday or the day before like i woke up like like 6 a.m went for a run because i wanted to see the sunrise and then on sunday i did nine miles of activity saw the sunset i've been going to the gym and like yeah so like i think as like we age like we're we're 30 now or something like that uh you find like a value in little things like having a picnic and just going like you know like doing like a little getaway outside the city you know going hiking canoeing and all that rather than like uh having a a bottomless brunch like I don't do those like I don't partake in drinking like during the day or so because it's just like I feel like an idiot because they hope the rest of the day is like, ruined yeah yeah but like in our early 20s that was like oh I can do it and did you stay there the whole lockdown yep what was that yes. like were there lots of people around or did many people leave the city? Many people left the city, yeah. And it was, I don't know, it was weird. But, like, a lot of things were still open. Like, of course, like, not, not nightlife. Uh, like I could get anything that I wanted, like, essential things. I bought a bike, so I would cycle every day. I would do 10 miles a day. And then I would just like read, watch things that I never watched before. And then of course, like work kept me a little busy, but it wasn't bad. That's a lot of diffraction. That's when you realize that like uh, you're capable and you don't need uh, affirmation from others to feel that you're valued, you know, you gotta value yourself. I think it did change me in, in that sense. Like right now, I don't have patience with idiots. Like if someone is being mean to me or other people, that person is done. Like I don't even have energy to even confront them. I'm like, mm-hmm. adios. Nice. Uh-huh. <laughs> I feel it's like weird. you never had energy for that. <laughs> it's gotten worse. <laughs> I think that's a good way to be. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then, yeah, I had a few friends. Like, we we did a lot of park things, like Central Park, like, like when it was nice out, like, played some games, like, kicked around the football and all that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And has it gone back, has the city gone back to normal again? Oh, it's been more than a year. Yeah. Everything crosses at four, if not, like, 24-7. And, uh, yeah, there's concerts. Madison Square Garden has been sold out multiple times by different artists. Um, like Harry Styles was just here, did a whole week. Uh, Burner Boy was here uh, before that. And um, games, like, like, yeah. So, like, even there's no... Uh, it's 
so it's been actually yeah it's been way more uh, over a year like you don't have to show proof of vaccination to enter establishments anymore like even boarding an airplane you don't have to do that and you don't even did, have to wear a mask did um did a lot of things close did a lot of businesses not survive yep a lot of them yeah bars restaurants like you remember Delmonico's like on uh the, the it's steak like restaurant the old, yeah yeah it's the oldest restaurant in New York City I believe it, it shut down permanently yep it hasn't opened its doors since the pandemic huh yeah but have new places popped up because I'm asking because London even though yeah there's no I mean I feel like the UK we never like we had rules but they weren't really necessarily ever followed so it wasn't like a big and we never had vaccine checking but it was it's still like it's just but I think it's more with the supply chain issues and the employment issues it's like hospitality has not gone back to normal it's just like restaurants can't open because of staff issues or you know it's it's just kind of like the city has been changed permanently it's like stuff just doesn't really seem to work properly but then there's all the economic reasons and stuff as well yeah, but here people have found new ways of uh, doing business for example like uh, one thing that two things that are very obvious that have emerged from the pandemic one is out- outdoor dining so most restaurants literally have like an outdoor seating. And that's even now in the winter, now that winter is approaching, like they are actually creating more, like that are kind of heated and are, they're, they are comfortable. Like it, 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 it's more like Europe now because that's mostly like if, you, like if you're in France, uh, Italy, Spain, you have a lot of outdoor seating. So that's one. And then two, technology. Uh, for example, like this was it's probably already there in Europe, um, like to help with the like uh, staff shortages, um, like most places now, like if, when you enter their establishment and you see that you can actually like use your phone, scan the code and look at the menu. You don't have to wait for the waiter and then uh, order through the app. And then they will bring your food and drinks to you whenever, so, you know, like prior, before, like you'd have a, you would have to wait for a person to come and make sure they go around and then do that. But this expedite is like, it's more ex- expedient. And then you don't need as many people to cater uh, to the patients. Huh. Do you still yeah. have to so, give them the 20% tip or whatever it is? Yeah, it's America. <laughs> <laughs> I just couldn't get over that when you have to tip, like, hairdressers. Oh, the, yeah, it's not only the hairdresser. It's, like, the person that washes your hair as well. It's, like, they they get separate tips. It's, like, can't you just put it in the price? <laughs> like, what it's annoying, on? yeah. It's capitalism on steroids. Um, Great. Is there anything else? <laughs> I feel like this has just been a very random conversation. Um, well, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be fun editing. <laughs> no, I don't edit them at all. You don't? No, because oh, oh. it's fully <laughs> genuine. Wow. I don't want to trick the audience into some, you know. It's like this is just two people chatting, honestly. Um, is there anything else you want to say? Uh, let me see. Oh, I have plants now. I'm a plant daddy. Plants? <laughs> yeah. Nice. <I> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How about you? Are, How is everything? Are you, are you still Airbnb? Uh, not really. Since the pandemic, mm and like no travel, and because for the most uh, part, I was doing it because of travel, like uh, the Monday to Thursday thing. So, you might as well have someone use it, make a little extra money if you're overpaying for a place and you're not, you're not there. Yeah. Yeah, I did that as well. 
Did, okay, can I ask my last three questions? Oh, three, okay. And then that I ask everyone, except most of the time I forget. And then I'll tell you about me um, when we stop recording because I don't think the audience really cares um, <laughs> to hear. Um, okay, so is there a book that had a big influence on your life? Yes. Okay, so it's a theme. There's three. And you did ask, like, um, so the one thing that was shocking the most was that I learned about African history here in the U.S. And it wasn't because I was at, like, high school or there was a mandated class, like, part of your prerequisites uh, to learn about it. Like, for example, like, you, you, you read... To kill a mockingbird because it's part of the curriculum in, in English uh, class in high school. So I went out of my way and specialized in African studies. So the one book that was very shocking to me was King Leopold's Congo. So it's about uh, the colonization of um, the Congo by... Belgium. So King Rupert II is the one, like the things that they uh, they did in the heart of Africa was crazy. And then the other one is uh, Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe. Some people say Akebe. So he writes about like Nigeria, like before colonial times like before the British and also during the British like how everything changed especially when it came to religion and you know that and then the other one is this little book it's actually it's a very easy to read it's uh, it's called The Heart of Darkness by Joseph oh, Conrad I have that uh-huh. I got it as a gift I got it I don't know, somehow it's on my bookshelf, but I actually don't know anything about it. So please yeah. continue. No, you should read it. It's very short. Yeah. So this talks about, I guess, I, again, um, it does talk about the Congo. So I'll, I'll let the audience, I, I won't go through it. They can, uh, they can uh, do a little quick notes of it. Yeah. What was the first book on the Congo called? King Leopold's uh, Congo. Let me make sure. It's, uh... And was this at uni you spoke, uh, focused on African studies? Yep. Let me see. Book. Let me actually. Oh, sorry. It's King. Leopold's ghost, like ghost, mm-hmm. yeah, nah, yeah, uh huh. That's why editing is important. Take out my <laughs> no, yeah, so yeah, so... that's even that's, that's yeah, how so it's gonna that be, was, yeah, yeah, that okay, was, yeah. What are we gonna second say? question? <laughs> what? what, second question? Oh, second question, do you? meditate or do you have any mindfulness or spiritual practices that help you um no it's mostly running so exercise and then doing things that calm me like cooking like past two three months for example i have made most of my meals unless it was like a a friend's like event where we have to go out and eat because it's someone's birthday or just catching up so that like keeps me calm 
Wow. And yeah, that's yeah. a big deal for New York. Because I don't think I cooked one single time the whole <laughs> the whole time I lived there. The apartment by your stove was brand new. <laughs> My stove? Well, I don't think the apartment even had a stove. See, the... You don't even remember. <laughs> um, I think on Super Bowl Sunday I made something to bring. <laughs> I remember it was a very sexist party where the women had to make something to bring. <laughs> I didn't understand that. Anyway. Um, okay. Last question. What are the three words that describe the person, how you want to turn up in the world? Show up in the world. Uh... Oh, okay. So I want to be compassionate regardless uh, where I am, whether I'm making $20,000 a year or a few million dollars a year, I want to be compassionate. And then two, I want to be useful whether to people, the environment, um, you know, our society, to be useful. And then, uh, three, I want to be happy. Nice. That's the first time someone said that, but that's, a really good one. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for the invite. <laughs>